Welcome to the Psychology in Schools team training session on supporting your staff group or team. This session will last approximately 60 minutes and we would recommend that you have a pen and paper so that you can pause at certain points and complete the tasks. My name is Dr Beth Mosley. I'm a lead clinical psychologist and I'll be presenting to you today. I work in schools across West Suffolk. This session is designed for any member of school staff who might manage a team or may be in a leadership position. The learning objectives today are to consider the unique challenges that school leaders or managers within a school environment may face returning to school in September 2020 following the COVID-19 pandemic. To help build understanding of the needs of vulnerable staff, to develop knowledge about core beliefs or behaviours that build resilient organisations, to support anyone in a leadership position to consider how they can support the well-being of their team as team members collectively as well as individuals. And most importantly, to recognise the importance of looking after your own well-being. COVID-19 has put more emphasis on the value of education in supporting well-being of young people. It has been widely recognised that going forward, schools will play a huge role in helping manage and respond to the needs of young people, not just from a learning point of view, but also in considering their well-being and mental health. It's also been acknowledged what a toll this can take on school staff who are going to be critical and fundamental in responding to this need. As such, there has been a wellbeing charter proposed for schools, which will look at promoting wellbeing across the school community and considering the mental health and wellbeing needs of school staff so that those needs can be met and challenges with wellbeing can be destigmatized. So it's important to note at the beginning of this training session that there is a move more generally and an acknowledgement of the value and, and need to support school staff as they are on the front line of responding to the needs of young people following this um, pandemic. So if you could use this opportunity to use your pen and paper to write down in 30 seconds the challenges your team faced before COVID-19. So if you could pause the video and just jot down very quickly what challenges your team faced in the academic year, the term or the build up or lead up to just before lockdown. Now take a little bit more time to write down in about one minute the challenges you think your team will face returning to school in September, holding in mind that for many staff they may not have been in school or if they have, they would have been not working within their usual way. Pause the video and take about one minute to do this exercise. I think we can acknowledge that within the teaching profession, there are many challenges that existed prior to COVID-19. We know that the, dem the demands of the job are high, not just physically, but also emotionally. Things like parents' behaviour, excessive workload, can have a huge impact on staff members' sense of, of productivity and well-being. Things like workplace bullying, the school environment. For many schools who are new buildings, this may be positive, but there are many schools with older buildings where they may be tolerating standards or, that feel not ideal. In some environments, there may be a lack of opportunity for professional learning. There may be a feeling of low morale and exhaustion from excessive change. The school year is fast paced and ever changing and there's little time to pause for reflection. So I think the environment is incredibly demanding um, and requires huge amounts of flexibility and adaptability. In some school environments, there may be a culture of blame with some teachers uh, striving for perfection. As a, as a way of, uh, of managing their, their workload. And we may see poor communication. When we think about um, what 
challenges that we now are presented with as we return to school in September that are unique to COVID, we are probably going to be adding to rather than taking away any of the prior challenges. So again, there are going to be concerns around health and the risks that are posed by being in the school environment. There's going to be concerns around how do we manage those social distancing guidelines within ourselves, our staff group and with the young people we're working with. We may see an increased mental health need in students and members of staff. And we're also going to be ever mindful of that bigger differentiation in student learning gap. Some students may have been working very hard at home and have had a lot of support from their families and other students may not have completed much work and have had not much support or accessibility to the curriculum during that time. The pressure that's going to be put on staff to help their students catch up with their missed learning and the resulting curriculum changes, particularly for those year groups like year 11 and year 13, where they'll be taking their exams this coming year, are again going to create extra pressures. There may be less people at work because of the issues around shielding. And of course, with the track and trace program, we may find periods where people are not able to attend work because they are symptomatic of COVID. We may be worried about increased behaviour challenges in students whose anxiety levels may be higher or returning to school in September. We may see some young people who have not been living in very structured environments who may struggle with the challenge of returning to school and all the new rules that they're going to have to follow. We may see more parental and student anxiety across the board, which may bring out the worst in, in people that, and, and make them more sensitive and, and difficult to cope with some of the changes that are required. We may see no more school and attendance. And again, there are going to be new ways of working that will need to be put in place to accommodate the risk management of COVID-19. And of course, those may need to change and fluctuate quite regularly. So I'm not sure about your list um, and what may be unique to your team and the environment you're working in, but I imagine that the original demands that you've had on your job are likely to stay the same and that there will be additional ones which you'll be facing unique to COVID, which again is probably going to contribute to a sense of anxiety about the school year starting in September. What we know about looking after staff wellbeing within the teaching arena is that teachers are in a unique position where they have um, little control over many of the things that are imposed on them, such as targets and inspections and the curriculum, because they're dictated by policy makers and, and education authorities. And this is particularly true during this time of COVID. I'm sure the experience has been that sense of being told at the very last minute what's going to happen and having to respond to that very quickly and not have much control sometimes over what's needed or required. And at the same time, the guidance may offer lots of opportunities for handling things differently, which can create its own stresses and anxieties because um, it requires a subjective interpretation of the way things should be. So I imagine for many leaders, there has been this roller coaster ride over the last six months of having to respond very quickly to what you're being told needs to happen um, by the government, but also being given guidance, which means that you have to spend a lot of time and energy working out how you apply that guidance for your particular staff group and, and young people that you have at your school. So when we don't have much control over some of the things that are actually have a huge influence on us, it's really important to consider those things that we do have more control over and then concentrate our efforts on working in those areas. So where there is more control there, it's around relationship building, workload efficiency, the areas where we do have autonomy, opportunities for professional learning, addressing professional isolation and rewarding achievement at work. Again, that's how you address this and how you do this will very much be dependent on the various factors um, which may be unique to you and your school and, and where you're working, where you are in the country, what, what age group you're teaching, the composition of your school, the needs of the school demographic, and also your leadership style and the way that you, your, your, you work um, and your personality. 
Now, it's important at this point, really, to consider that coming back to school in September, there are many young people and, and staff who will be raring to go and really positive about getting back to work and back to school and learning. But there will be, based on the research, we know more, um, there will be some members of, of the staff community and school student community who will be more vulnerable to struggling with their well-being and mental health and that transition back into school. So it's important just to identify some of those issues. So anyone who's had some direct exposure to COVID-19, whether that's with themselves being ill or a loved one or family member being ill or dying potentially from COVID, those members of staff or students are likely to struggle more on the return to work or school. Um, thinking about those members of staff or students who may have a mem member in the family home who was a key worker who might have been working directly with COVID in a health context, um, there may have been increased anxiety for those, those people during the time when they may have been worried about their, their um, family member having exposure and getting ill. Anyone with a history of a significant mental health difficulty, so depression or anxiety or a history of risk taking behaviour is more likely to struggle um, on the return to school or, 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 or really the return to normality. And again, people who have experienced prior traumatic events are at more risk. So those might be the people who've experienced community or domestic violence. We know that domestic violence has significantly increased during this period of time. And these are the kind of things that members of staff, if they've had this experience during the, during the lockdown period or perhaps prior in their life before lockdown, um, you may not know about that. So it's really important to hold in mind that some of these, these things that make people more vulnerable are maybe unknowns to you, especially if they've happened historically and that is information that you, is not available to you. So anyone with a history of abuse or neglect who might have been a refugee or be a refugee or s seeking political asylum, members of economically disadvantaged groups, and there's been lots of reference to how disadvantaged groups have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Again, medically vulnerable individuals, so people who may have been shielding during this time and anyone who may be from a disaster prone region and hold in mind that this research is taken from um, is, is global and obviously there are other parts of the world where significant events like this pandemic are also um, happening concurrent with other significant um, tra significantly traumatic events. New research specific to COVID-19 is now available exploring both health and mental health vulnerability factors around COVID-19. And what we know is that from this research is that disadvantaged and marginalised groups are disproportionately affected both in terms of health and mental health. Um, so those communities where there's been some specific research into this are the black, Asian and minority ethnicity groups. Um, where we can see that they have both health, uh, higher health risks around COVID, but also higher health risks around mental health. And the same is also true of the LGBTQ plus community. So I've just put some references here if you might be interested at in looking this in any more detail. So how what we notice those who may need extra help? So some of the red flags are not being able to adjust over a period of time even if support is being put in place. So, so that kind of transition back into normal life is going to take longer for many people, um, but for some it may extend beyond the expected time that we would, we would hope to see people beginning to adjust back into to normality. We may see increasing levels of emotional distress rather than reducing levels of distress. We may see um, people who or missing work and are not um, coming into work as frequently as, as we would expect. People who may withdraw or isolate themselves from the group or from one another, um, not engaging in tasks or, or activities that are part of the job or just part of um, kind of connecting with your team. That sense of hopelessness of, and being stuck 
I think when you um, when you are aware of somebody that you've probably had a relationship with before and you've known before and you get this overwhelming sense that they're feeling hopeless and stuck, I think you can almost feel it when you interact with that other person. That feeling really is a warning sign for you as, as a person, a leader or a manager, that maybe this person may need something more. For those staff members, um, it's possible that they may require more specialist support services outside of what you can offer them yourself or what school can offer. There are counselling services that many schools are signed up to, um, which are free and part of um, the school support pack. So it'd be important to be aware of those. I'm sure you already are. But also it's important to know that Department of Education has provided funding to educate support partnerships to provide online peer support and telephone supervision as a new service. So that's available if you look at the link at the bottom of the page. So it might be that those staff members need this kind of support or they might need more specialist input if they're if they're starting to to struggle with more significant mental health um, challenges around perhaps um, significant low mood or anxiety. So now be, we'll have an opportunity to do some reflection really um, and think about what you might consider your role is in supporting your team. So take a few minutes to consider some of these questions and if possible, pause the video and write down your answers. So thinking about your team that you you hopefully have worked with and if you're new to, to managing a team, if you're coming into the new term and into a new school or a new role, you this may be more difficult. But consider who in your team you may be aware may have increased vulnerability factors based on your knowledge of how lockdown may have been for them, but also based on your knowledge of the things and the challenges that they might have experienced in their earlier life before COVID. Think about how you might know if any members of your team fall into this vulnerable group. Consider how you would know if team members are struggling. And this may be even more relevant for you if you are joining a school or becoming um, are you, you're new to this role. So what would be uh, the things that would help you identify that someone is struggling? If you know your team, it might be quite nice to think about who those members of the team and write their names down and think about what might be the telltale signs for you based on what their normal personality and, and their attitude to work might be prior to COVID. And have a think about the culture of your team, the ways that you might have coped as a team with stress and adversity before COVID, but also during COVID, because I'm sure that you will have stayed connected to your team and you'll have had to navigate this really tricky last six months. So consider the way your team have successfully dealt with stress and adversity and also hold in mind sometimes the, the times that it hasn't worked so well. So pause the video and reflect on some of these questions, please. Resilience can be defined in a number of different ways, and this means that it can sometimes be a confusing concept to understand it, certainly a buzzword. Most definitions have really commonly referred to two things. One is overcoming adversity, and two is being able to adapt to challenging situations. In light of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's really useful to explore how resilience can be promoted for teachers at this time. Because essentially what we're asking teachers to do is support positive adaptation in the face of significant challenge. Research has looked into how teacher resilience can be promoted and eroded over time. And it suggests that resilience is a process rather than an internal trait which means that resilience can change over time depending on the context or situation. So it's not a case of having or not having resilience. Therefore, we're in a position as leaders to have an opportunity to be able to promote resilience in teachers, which is particularly relevant at this current time. We also know from the research that resilience can be found in the culture of an organisation. Caregiving organisations like schools and hospitals have unique challenges to building resilience in them due to the demands on staff to provide constant care to those who are responsible for them, that they're responsible for. This is really demanding and creates its own stresses and responsibilities. 
What the research tells us is there are three core beliefs and behaviours that define resilient organisations. These are strength of working relationships, the importance of emotional life and the world as manageable. In terms of strength of working relationships, we know that a primary belief at the heart of resilient organisations is that members move toward one another rather than away from one another when they experience stress and anxiety. So those members have a core conviction that they must band together within and across the groups in their organisation if they're to thrive collectively and individually. This belief is not just something people talk about, it's also enacted in how people go about their daily work together as well as how they instinctively react to difficult and challenging situations. It's important to note that in resilient organisations, members place much importance on clear communication processes. Leaders and members work really hard to share information with one another, even in the context of authority structures that make it really difficult for them to communicate openly. They take time to meet and clarify situations rather than rush to respond without a complex understanding of what they're trying to do and why. They listen actively to one another. They approach problems together and develop solutions collaboratively. Of course, there are disagreements and this is natural, but it's done in a respectful way in the context of valuing one another's work and the relationships. So at the heart of resilience is this sense of being in it together of members knowing that they will not have to face difficulties by themselves. And I'm sure that during this time, the knowledge of that within the last six months within your team has been a particularly important part of feeling like you can manage the, the daily strains of the work that you've been having to do. So this is an opportunity to reflect on these ideas around the strength of work relationships. I'd like you to think about and come up with an example when your team have moved towards one another in adversity. And also think about times when that hasn't been possible and what might get in the way of it happening. Consider your role and how you could support your team to do this more, especially in September when everybody will be starting back at school and the way that you'll be communicating will be different from how it might have been during the lockdown period. So pause the video and spend some time with pen and paper just answering these questions for yourself and your team. The second key important theme is that beneath people's daily routines of teaching, meetings, responding to emails, there's another sort of reality worth paying attention to. The emotions that members experience while working with those they're looking after, but also one another. It's likely that those working in caregiving organisations like teaching them are going to feel quite a lot in the course of their work. Going to have emotional reactions of your own triggered by the work. In resilient cultures, these emotions are respected and offer valuable information about the work. These cultures believe that paying attention to these emotions enables them to create the relationships they need to survive in the work. This belief is enacted in how people work with emotions on a daily basis. So people engage in relatively open emotional expression. They tell one another when they're saddened or upset by a certain event. They also express happiness and excitement and joy to one another. They tolerate rather than turn away from difficult emotions triggered by their work. And they do this as part of their routine interactions, checking in with one another when they meet. Another important thing to think about is that in resilient organisations, members tell stories that keep emotions essential, not on the edges or absent. They examine emotions as information rather than taking them personally and validate and normalise them for each other which enables people to get back to the work of coping with the man and managing the emotions of those they're working with. 
So again, a task to think about, so an opportunity for reflection. Again, with pen and paper if possible, consider these questions. How do your team respond to emotions in the workplace? What's characteristic for them as a team? Does this differ from the wider work culture? So is your team different? Do they manage emotions and respond to emotions differently, perhaps to the broader culture in your school? Can you find an example where you've been able to encourage this in your team, where you've been, in, been able to enable the expression of emotions, whether they're difficult or positive, and you've been able to help normalise them and validate them for people? And what might get in the way of doing this in your team place of work? So what are the challenges with trying to achieve this? Is it to do with certain personalities in your team? Is it to do with your difficulties in this area? Um, more emotionally expressive people will find this easier than people who perhaps have a tendency to manage their feelings within themselves. Or is it about time and place and not being able to provide the opportunities to do this collectively as a group? So pause the video now and consider these questions. The third belief associated with resilience is that organisational life is manageable, it's comprehensible and it's meaningful. So members believe that adversity can be overcome and can indeed strengthen people. When people believe they have some degree of control over events in their world, that what they do will make a difference, that their influence is real, they're more likely to actually try and shape events positively. This is referred to as learned optimism. This belief is clear in individuals who approach their work and the stories they tell about their work experience. Think about someone in your team who may naturally have this approach to challenges. These people are likely to approach difficult situations with less fear and more belief that this is an opportunity for learning or growth. They have the assumption that they will be able to resolve the challenges with the resources at their disposal without being damaged themselves. They are then likely to tell and retell stories that make clear that they've met and overcome adversity. They make sense of this adversity. They make it understandable and meaningful for themselves and others through this process of telling the story in words. The process itself continues to build resilience. So again, an opportunity for reflection. Consider what is your natural response to challenges? What about your team? How do they view challenges? And to think of a story where your team have met and overcome adversity. You may have a really lovely story from during this period of COVID-19 lockdown, or you might have a story that predates this time. Pause the video and take some time to write down and consider these questions. So now we're going to think about how you might support your staff group or team. And we're going to cover these five key points, all of which link into these three beliefs of resilient organisations. So first of all, the power of listening, then the power of vulnerability and empathy, nurturing resilience, addressing stress and promoting help seeking. So the first one, the power of listening. So what I would like you to do is, if possible, pause the presentation and type this link into your browser so that you can watch this YouTube clip on being a good listener. Once you've done that, if you could then return to the slideshow video, that would be great. So having listened to being a good listener, if you could just reflect on what elements of these skills you think you already have and do naturally quite well and those ones that you might need to build on. A really good question for anyone in, in a school setting is how on earth do you make time in a busy day with your own whirlwind of pressures to create the space to do this for staff who might need it? So if you wouldn't mind just pausing the video and maybe jotting down some ideas about how you might be able to do that. 
Here are some top tips for communicating with staff members who may be struggling and you might have to have a difficult conversation with where they may be feeling distress. So, of course, first and foremost, the ability to do this great listening requires you to almost park what's happening in your own busy mind or your own body, which may be filled, filled with adrenaline and stress itself. So trying to enable yourself to feel calm, take some dose of slow deep breaths and almost set aside um, the, the rushing around that might be happening in your brain about what you need to do next so that you can fully focus and be present with that person. So those two minutes of conversation may be hugely more valuable if you can do that rather than be preoccupied in your own mind and try and organise a conversation at another point. So use active listening and some of the film has described what that might look like. So ensuring you make regular eye contact, you have an open and accepting posture. And it's just being mindful because sometimes it's more comfortable to stand with our arms crossed, um, but this might send uh, the wrong signals to a person. So it's just trying to be more mindful about the way that our, what our body back language looks like. Using summarizing statements of what I'm hearing is, or so in other words, can be really helpful in helping reflect back what, you, what you're hearing so that the listener knows you are listening and also enables clarification. And again, if you're able to reflect back what you've heard, then it can help the person to reflect on what they've said and enable them the opportunity to clarify meanings. By doing this in this way, you're able to acknowledge and validate feelings and give a sense of acceptance, moving away from the position of judgment or rushing towards solutions is really helpful for somebody who's in distress and really just needs to have that sense of connection. So as hard and difficult it is, try not to rush it. If you can take your time and leave space in the conversation. And if you are in a rush because the school day requires you to be somewhere else. Ensure that you use this warm, warm, compassionate approach, but are clear about creating some safe time and space that you're able to meet with that member of staff that will suit you both so that you can um, be in a better position not to rush. So the second area is the power of vulnerability and empathy. Now, Brené Brown is a great writer and researcher in this area, and she talks about vulnerability and says it sounds like truth and feels like courage. As leaders, vulnerability is critical to how we manage and respond to feelings and emotions and, and how we work with our teams. I'd like you again, as you did with the previous slide, to, to type this address into your browser so that you can watch this very short two minute clip on empathy. Once you've watched that, if you could then come back to the training and then there'll be an opportunity to reflect on what you've seen. So thank you for coming back. Um, so having watched that, what do you think might be the barriers for you being able to do this in the workplace? A bit like those barriers for good listening. How can we um, Think of solutions to reduce those barriers. Again, you might want to pause this and jot some ideas down. So in terms of supporting your staff group or team with nurturing resilience, an important element of this is really about helping to create an environment where staff feel able to seek help from one another. And again, as we talked about with the three core beliefs, um, having a culture where people come towards one another rather than away from each other when they're facing adversity or distress and there's the opportunity to name and validate difficult feelings or are going to help create that environment. We might need to do this by supporting members of staff in a more formal way, for example, forming small groups or pairing up with a buddy. This can be particularly helpful for those members of staff who might not have strong relationships within the team already, um, or for those who might perhaps be more introverted and less likely to turn to others for help. So providing a more formal way by, by encouraging people or actually 
creating a formal pairing up with a buddy could be really helpful. By providing this sense of a mutual support network, then it, there is also the opportunity where staff can influence outcomes positively and again work towards solutions as a team. So if we think again about the world as manageable and this notion that difficulties are actually overcomable and team members can contribute to um, overcoming those difficulties and having a sense of agency and control over them is really helpful in nurturing that resilience. And I think another key fact that we know is really supportive of staff wellbeing is ensuring that staff have the opportunity to continue their professional development. We know that that leads to an increase in job satisfaction and it, it contributes to wellbeing and resilience. So making sure that you formally do this perhaps in any management meetings you might be doing with your staff, but that you encourage a general feeling of professional development in the work that you're doing on a daily or weekly basis. So providing opportunities for reflection and learning and seeing things that might not be working well as opportunities to consider um, what we can learn and how we can maybe do this differently was really helpful for staff. I think it's really important to acknowledge here that this can feel like a huge burden, especially when you're really busy and consumed with your own tasks. But nurturing relationship with staff doesn't necessarily need to be a time consuming process. This is often conceptualized as ordinary magic, where people are taking advantage of everyday opportunities to build in this relational support and opportunities to connect, which we would anticipate would help teachers feel valued and held in mind. And this is true for all of our interactions. So it's very much those small interactions, those greetings, or non-verbal body language. If we're stressed and rushing around and looking like closed down and like we couldn't handle speaking to anyone, then it's possible that we might um, make it difficult for people to, to feel that they can share some of their challenges or difficulties. But if we're able to walk around with a sense of openness and warmth um, and interest in other people and holding on to information that we might know about them if we've had a conversation those small conversations we have with people we mustn't underestimate the value of them if we find out that somebody's birthday party for their daughters at the weekend checking in very briefly how did that birthday party go those small things can make such a difference and sometimes we have these bits of information in our head and we don't necessarily um, share them or let them come out of our mouth when we see people but I think actually those small gestures and opportunities to let people, others know that we have held them in mind, we are um, interested in them and how they're getting on, can actually make a huge difference to how well people looked after, or feel looked after, as well as, um, as how your team functions as a group. The Young Minds um, have got some great resources and here is an idea if you want to pause this and read through these ideas about supporting staff wellbeing, that's, you certainly can. The other area is how to support your team or staff uh, group around addressing stress. I think once you've identified sources of stress in your staff, it's really important to find ways of addressing them. So here are a few ideas. So work-life balance is a huge challenge, and I think even more so in the teaching profession because it's during term time that that work-life balance seems to go completely out the window because the demands of the job and the pace of the job are so high. So helping ensure that your team have the opportunity to look after their own basic needs like eating and lunch um, and having time just to to use the toilet, even that can be a challenge sometimes in a really busy day if you have got many free periods. Um, and the government have produced a toolkit for school staff to help them reduce workload, which may be helpful in looking at tips. And it might be something you want to share with your team um, and help them collectively to think together about some of the, the tips that might be helpful in terms of the way that you work together as a team. Tackling the environment is also important. Your environment really does influence how you feel. For many schools and classroom environments, there's gonna be a huge amount of decluttering that's taken place in order to keep things cleaner. 
In some ways that can depersonalize space and make things feel less warm and friendly, but it does potentially offer an opportunity to make things feel uh, fresher and newer and not so bogged down with, um, with years and piles of, of, of old school books. And that can actually improve um, workplace uh, stress levels. I think perfectionism is a real challenge and for anyone who's proud of, of their work and their achievements, um, often <laughs> the striving for perfection is a big part of what's enabled you to get to your to the level that you have in your profession. Um, I think it's important, particularly during these, these times when we haven't got as much control as we normally do over our daily life, um, that we really kind of think about expectations for ourselves and others. And perfectionism can be really unhelpful because it can place unrealistic demands on ourselves. And, and it means that we can often place unrealistic demands on to other people. So I think, again, as we return to school, it's enabling those expectations for ourselves and others to potentially shift and change from what we might normally expect because there is going to be this transition period and people are going to feel less able to cope with some of some of the things they might have coped with previously. And a focus on happiness, so not getting preoccupied with all the negatives and instead looking at how can we reward achievements and share successes um, and reflect on the things that have been challenging and the opportunities that we've had um, for learning and improving our kind of sense of happiness and well-being as a team. Um, and trying to find examples of things that have gone well, which have worked well for people and how we can encourage more of those things to happen rather than less. There are some explicit activities that have been used with other school staff successfully to help with this, if you wanted to do something more formally and some more ex some exercises within your team meetings, and they're included with this pack, and you can find some of them as links at the end of the in the reference section. So this is an example of one of those exercises: what keeps us going, and it really is there to help engage staff in thinking about their own mental health and how they cope with issues that they face. So again, this would be a great thing that you could perhaps do in one of your team exercise meetings and could actually be a fun way to engage everybody in explicitly thinking about these things. And again, it's an opportunity to encourage those um, three core areas around um, thinking about coming together under stress, validating emotions and making sure emotions are an important part of the work and also seeing the, the challenges we face as manageable. And finally, promoting help seeking. Quite often within the education environment, help seeking might be viewed as failure. And we really need to encourage people to see that actually seeking help is a great way to enabling others to support you. So as much um, of this we can do in our own ways that we might seek help and be open about what might be um, ways that our team can help us within our team. But there are certain other things that we can do to enable staff to contribute to decisions, to include them and make it feel like an inclusive environment. Actually asking staff explicitly if they need additional support and what that might look like because for one member of staff support may look very different for yourself or another. And also encouraging staff to seek help from their peers. Um, teachers report is really uh, helpful to use their peers as sounding boards. And this is where um, having um, potentially buddies could be really helpful. And I guess making sure that as senior leaders, we do encourage and invite feedback um, during staff check-ins or briefings so that we aren't just sharing information but we're also listening and asking and looking for feedback as to how well that information is being received, if it's been properly understood and if people are happy with the, the decisions that have been made. And finally, the last slide. I think the value of considering your own well-being, although this comes last, essentially does need to come first. Just as it says in the quote, you can't pour from an empty cup, fill up and take care of yourself first. 
And there is another um, pack, uh, training pack that we've got, which actually covers this. Um, so if you would like to have a look at that in more detail, then please do go to the resource library to get that. So really five key points here. Know your own personal limits and have the ability to say no when necessary. Again, this is great for you. It helps you get that balance in life. But it's also really important to role model it to your team as well, because it will enable them to take better care of themselves too. Identify supportive people that you have in your life and make sure that you use those supportive people, especially when you might be struggling the most, because sometimes we find ourselves actually moving away from and withdrawing from people when we're really struggling. When we notice that feeling in ourselves, it's really important to, even if it feels wrong, to reach out to those that we, we know are likely to be able to support and help us. If we don't have many of those people, it might be worth considering how we could increase our support network to enable us to have more access to, to that support. And of course, there is always the option that if necessary, you feel it would be helpful, you could speak to a professional for more support. Talking is really helpful, and there are times when challenging situations at work may affect us emotionally. And it's often times that our home life and things that are happening at home can also have an impact on our capacity to manage what's happening at work. So if you've had a difficult day at school, it's really helpful if you've got the opportunity to speak to someone before you leave school, as this can help you process how you're feeling, um, reflect on it, process it, and, um, and also allow you to have some separation between work and home life, which well, may well have been very challenging for lots of people as they've been having to manage their work at home. Again, if you're not able to do that before the end of the school day, trying to do that with um, someone that is supportive to you um, on your journey home or perhaps when you get home from work. Being flexible around change is really important. Even with the best plans, we know unexpected events or situations can and will occur. And this is going to be especially true in that first term back. It's very likely that the plans that have been put afoot will need to change and change again. And if you work in the teaching profession or school environment, you'll be well used to this. So managing that and being open, I guess, with yourself and the other people around you about the demands that this places on you um, is really important because we know that needing to um, cope with uncertainty and change can induce feelings of anxiety and stress. And finally, self-compassion. We're often our own worst critics um, and the advice that we give to other people when they're in distress is often not the advice we actually offer ourselves when we're in distress. So it's really important to cultivate this sense of self-compassion and, and talk to ourselves kindly. All too often we might get consumed with negative thoughts about how we could have dealt with something better. I think this is very natural part of being a human being. We do tend to notice the negative more than we notice the positive. So we almost need to train ourselves to focus more on the positive and develop an encouraging voice in our head and turn down the volume on those critical voices. The Anna Freud Centre have some amazing resources around supporting staff wellbeing, and this may be something you might want to look at in more detail. And hold in mind everything that you learn to support your own wellbeing will also be helpful in terms of any support or guidance or advice you give to those that you might be working with. So if you become an expert in supporting your own wellbeing, you're likely to be able to have the resources to help and respond to other people and give them more guidance and opportunities um, for learning about how to support their own well-being. This is a really helpful exercise which you could do on your own or you could do in your staff group or maybe with a, an individual staff member that you might be working with who's struggling. Essentially it's about looking at mental health as kind of being a bit of a balancing act, looking at the things that might weigh you down and stress you out and what um, you do or how you feel, might feel overwhelmed. And then on the upside of the seesaw, looking at what cheers me up, what helps me remain calm and how do I relax? And I think it's really important to try to think about how we can name these different things on either side of, of, 
of the um, seesaw and ensure that when things do become more stressful and our lives become more difficult, that we do have this um, opportunity to include more of the positives. What we might find is that we go through phases where we feel overwhelmed and bogged down and we just ride it out um, and we don't feel like we've got the time or the space to include more of the positive aspects. But what we know from well-being is, is that if we can try and keep that balancing act and ensure that we do, when we are stressed, prioritise those important things that we know do enable us to look after ourselves, we're more likely to be able to manage and cope during those more difficult times. So just that you're aware, the Psychology and Schools team have completed five pre-recorded training sessions, all approximately an hour long each, covering these topics here. So if you'd like to access these, these will be available through the link that you um, would have had from the, for this training. The Psychology and Schools team have also put together a return to school support pack, which includes really helpful information for senior leadership teams um, and also gives an assembly um, and tutorial guide that can be used for settling students back into school, as well as um, a follow up tutorial or assembly, helping think about understanding and coping with emotions. The link to this support pack is included on this slide. Finally, we would really value your feedback so that we can improve these trainings and make them better. Um, if you could follow the link, the survey link, monkey link, it will take three minutes, a pack according to SurveyMonkey. If you could just fill that in, that would be immensely helpful to us. And last but not least, the resources and references that we hope will be very useful for you if you want to look at any of more of this information in detail. Um, thank you again for listening and taking the time to take part in this presentation. And we wish you well as you start back in school this term.